Forty years ago, audiences across the country were celebrating Halloween. Directed by a young, up-and-coming filmmaker named John Carpenter, the movie quickly turned a $300,000 budget into $70 million at the box office. Adjust those numbers for inflation, and that's get out money, but with a quarter of the production cost. Of course, we already know Halloween was a hit. And it's not just because after Michael came home, he continued to do so nine more times, with a tenth on the way. No, we know it was a hit because everyone copied it. From roughly 1978 to 1984, masked murderers invaded theaters and drive-ins as savvy executives broke down Halloween into a formula that could be recreated, rehashed, and repackaged until the entire thing was as dead as a promiscuous teenage victim. These creative killers were deemed slashers, and it was accepted knowledge that Halloween was the first slasher. But was it? Today, most slasher-related media is so self-aware that it's practically a separate genre. Ryan Murphy's television series Scream Queens turned the very idea of a slasher movie into pure camp. And while a few critics pointed to Happy Death Day as a possible resurgence of the form, most of its slasher pedigree is either superficial reference or the far better inversion. If these don't feel like slasher films, it's because they aren't. But they do showcase what we mean when we talk about them. Slashers are known for their tropes. Starting out as a studio rubric designed for mass production, these rules have been codified and evaluated over the decades through a litany of books, think pieces, and simple repetition. They include the mask, the hunt, and high body counts. There's the anniversary, often a holiday or notable occasion, of some past transgression, and the dark structure or location connected to it. And then, of course, we have the final girl. As Randy and Scream said, There are certain rules that one must abide by in order to successfully survive a horror movie. But a lot of these rules didn't originate with Halloween. Rather, Carpenter drew from a number of previous films and trends. And so we should take a look back at those previous works if we want to answer the question, what was the first slasher film? In a moment of historical harmony, there were actually three movies released between March and June of 1960 that had a direct influence on Carpenter and Halloween. Eyes Without a Face featured a white, expressionless mask that by his own admission, Carpenter and his co-writer Deborah Hill subconsciously referenced when designing Michael Myers. Peeping Tom, released only a month later, was pioneering the killer POV shot, a decade before Halloween's Steadicam opening scene did the same. But the greatest debt is undoubtedly to a film that, at the time, everyone thought would fail. The studio didn't even want it, forcing the director to finance the project personally and shoot with a crew culled from a cheap TV show. Clearly Alfred Hitchcock had made a losing bet, except Psycho broke box office records. Psycho is commonly referred to as the proto-slasher movie, and Carpenter didn't shy away from just how much his film really owed to Hitchcock's. Jamie Lee Curtis is, of course, the daughter of Janet Lee, Psycho's star until around the 50 minute mark. Dr. Sam Loomis, portrayed in Halloween by Donald Pleasance, even shares a name with John Gavin's less than effective male hero. But perhaps the greatest similarity between the two is the knife. At no point do Psycho and Halloween feel more in line than the two scenes where Norman Bates kills. When his arm falls, when he, for a lack of a better term, slashes, you can almost picture Michael Myers in his place. That's where the comparison ends, though. In just about every other way, Norman is a distinctly different type of villain. See, Hitchcock was concerned with a very particular, very human monster. Bates is arguably the most sympathetic character in the movie and a psychiatrist spends a good five minutes of the film explaining just how and why this mild-mannered creature is capable of such terrible, murderous deeds. Michael's doctor, meanwhile, just calls him it's purely and simply evil. In short, Psycho is not a slasher movie, though there are numerous commonalities, not the least of which is a blasphemous amount of money each made. Within four years, however, an Italian filmmaker would make his own claim for the slasher crown all without making a profit. Mario Bava's first credited work as a director, Black Sunday, was released only months after Psycho to broad international acclaim. A successful cinematographer since 1939, Bava's use of light and shadow immediately led critics to dub him an established master of horror. They were less kind to 1964's Blood and Lace. The plot is, honestly, largely inconsequential. What drew such ire, and what everyone remembers, were the murders. Bava's masked killer is, let's say, inventive. His victims are choked, drowned, burned against a hot furnace, and, in one particularly ingenious moment of improv, hit in the face with an antique spiked glove. Here, we find the hunt and the body count 
that would come to define the slasher. Finally, we're starting to see the tropes. And, along with Baba's earlier films, The Girl Who Knew Too Much, we're witnessing the birth of the Italian giallo. Giallo, or yellow, derives its name from the cover of cheap novels released in Italy during the post-war period, much in the same way that an inferior paper stock defined American pulp stories. Mixing aspects of the mystery thriller with horror, it reveled in technicolor depictions of eroticism and gore. Filmmakers like Bavo and Dario Argento made it into a veritable phenomenon, and in its style and popularity, it is often cited today as a thematic precursor to the slasher craze. But giallo films are distinctly crime tales. The ongoing whodunit in blood and black lace is conspicuously absent from Halloween, and only occasionally crops up in later imitations. In an interesting parallel, Italian audiences were quick to call Psycho one of the earliest gialli, but this is as misguided as calling Norman Bates a slasher. The lineage is clear, but the fact remains. These are not slasher films, so maybe we've gone too far back. Let's skip ahead, a whole decade this time, to a dark holiday in Toronto, and one of the most bizarre crimes in the annals of American history. We're speaking, of course, of Black Christmas and the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Both premiered in October 1974, a mere four years before Halloween. They feature a number of the requisite tropes and provide our first examples of the final girl, though not to the same archetypal degree as Laurie Strode. Really, these might be the best candidates yet for the title of first slasher, but then again, they're so different from each other. Just as they're both very different from Halloween, you can feel the dirt and sweat in Texas Chainsaw. The set was dirty and sweaty, and it owes more to Grindhouse than it does to Hitchcock or Bava. What Toby Hooper's talking about is the end of the era, not the beginning of one. Rather than furthering, he's destroying. Black Christmas is more in line with our proposed trajectory, particularly in the giallo tradition, but then it inevitably veers off the road as well. One of the most fascinating things about the film, and let us put a huge spoiler alert on this one, is that the whodunit amounts to nothing. You never learn who the killer is, other than his mundane name, Billy. Thanks, it's me, Billy. You never see his face, and he's never caught. This subversion is the most horrifying part of the movie, and it functions, much like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, as a period at the end of a sentence, rather than the beginning of a new era. Which brings us back to 1978, where the question still remains. Was Halloween the first slasher? It undoubtedly was the moment where all the disparate components developed over nearly two decades found their purest cohesion. It ticks off all the boxes, but then again, it wasn't trying to. The directive for Halloween was not to make a slasher film. Rather, it was about making a good horror movie. Pulling ideas from the past and introducing some of his own on the way, Carpenter was designing something unique and new, much like Hitchcock, Bava, or Hooper before him. Maybe we're being too sensitive, but it seems unfair to lump Halloween in with its imitators. To put it another way, if the rules are the metric, then who do we consider the first? The one the rules were based on, or the ones that first treated them as rules? If we say the second, then the first slasher film is Friday the 13th, but we're not even gonna touch that debate. This has been Gamma Ray, thanks for watching. Here's a question, what do you think the first slasher film is? Make your case in the comments below, hit subscribe, like, share with all your buddies, and we'll see you next time.